Hello and good morning, everybody. Welcome to our monthly webcast, It's All in Your Head. Our topic for today is Better or Exceptional, Optimizing Brain Functioning. We are going to be listening to Hiroko de Michelis, who champions precision neurometrics, the optimal performance division of Swingle Clinic. Before we begin, let me tell you a little bit about Hiroko. Hiroko is a registered clinical counselor with a master's in psychology and positive psychology. She has trained in the field of optimal performance with elite athletes, executives, children, and individuals wanting to achieve their potential. Much of her early training was done with her father, Dr. Bruno de Michelis, the owner of the de Michelis Man Room, most noted for his work with the Milan AC and Chelsea FC soccer teams. She is trained in mindfulness-based approaches from Bangor University in the UK and in REBT cognitive behavioral therapy from Birmingham University in the UK. Hiroko is also a board certified neurotherapist. Today we're going to have two breaks during this webcast so we can answer your questions. You can send them using the chat feature that is located in the control panel on the right side of your screen. Okay, so let's hear uh, what Hiroko has to say. Welcome Hiroko. Yes, thank you Angie and good morning to everyone that has the grace of listening to us on a lovely June Saturday and so here comes my first promise which is I'll try and keep this presentation fun and simple because it's Saturday for all of us. I will make a practical case study and I'll try and be as clear and maybe repetitive as possible so that my communication is, is effective and simple. So uh, what is it that I would like to discuss today with you? As Angie has it, I would like to talk about better or exceptional and how is it that we can optimize brain functioning. And in order to do that, I'll be talking about our optimal performance model that we have at the Swingle Clinic. So this whole notion of psychophysiology and the, the idea that every psychophysiological change is accompanied by a parallel change in, in the mental and emotional uh, state and conversely the opposite so that a change in the emotional, mental, neurological uh, arena trigger a change in the physiology and I would like to focus on uh, something special that we do at the single clinic. I would like to talk about brain driving, which is a proprietary or it's a specialty um, devised by the genius of Dr. Swingle that I hope is listening to us today this morning. So um, I, as Angie mentioned, I, I lead the Precision Neurometrics, which is the branch, the division of the Swingle clinic that focuses on uh, optimal brain function. And research in the 80s and 90s has found that overall uh, biofeedback and neurofeedback have a deep positive impact on performance. But mainly those were lab setting results. Uh, what we specialize in is the real world, the real world experience. We work with corporations, we work with uh, athletes, we uh, base our interventions on database collected from top athletes uh, database. So we pride ourselves to really be hands-on and really be based on the real world. So what is it that we mean when we talk about optimal performance? What do we, what do we mean? What is the, the model that we base upon? Um, so the idea, and here we are, um, I am quoting Thompson and Thompson, Linda and Michael in Toronto were also my mentors and uh, some uh, of my neurofeedback teachers. Um, the idea here is we are training to have a flexible brain, a brain that is able to produce calm, relaxed and yet alert brain waves. But we will talk about a lot about that notion of flexibility. This is a quite important idea and notion that uh, we will discuss and uh, that we will try and uh, develop. Uh, so the idea here is we are trying to increase the ability to concentrate, to focus, but with appropriate reflection before action. So this whole notion that talent 
can be optimized. And uh, Dr. Swingle has a very nice metaphor in his book, talking about the difference between a Volkswagen Beetle and a more sophisticated car. And being Italian, I like, for example, to think of Ferrari or Maserati or Lamborghini. And this idea of no matter what your car is, we are fine-tuning your skills. We are, no matter what your level of talent is, we can optimize it. So before we, um, we go straight into the, the core of the presentation, I'd like to discuss a couple of important points that we always um, want to point out when we make our presentations for the precision neurometrics and for the clinic, from the Sungur clinic in general. First of all, one size does not fit all. So this notion of one size fits all is false. Many, uh, in the last few years, many um, sort of franchisee uh, centers or um, uh, we see advertising for centers that offer standardized treatment in, in, in the field of neurofeedback. Um, our approach is very different. Our approach is customized, is individualized, and this is quite crucial. We need to assess our client in order to be making an effective intervention, in order to know what, where his potential lies and what we need to do and what we need to avoid. Because the other important notion is that no strong effects come without a stronger possible counter effect. So we really need to know and be sure of what we're doing in order to deliver our uh, efficacious therapy. So the third point is really when we seek for neurofeedback or neurotherapy, biofeedback, this type of interventions, we really need to make sure that we um, consult with a certified, well-trained practitioner. And in this case, I mentioned BCIA because it's the golden standard of certification. Uh, we need to know that the person that is uh, training our brain is sure of what he or she is doing. So let's go a little bit further into the presentation. We're talking about our brain working at it, its maximum efficiency. And who is it that we are uh, dealing with? Who is it that we are addressing in this approach? Uh, as we mentioned, we work with athletes, and this is peak performance athletes. I like to uh, make a joke about the fact that soccer, uh, I am Italian, so soccer in Italy and in Europe is a religion, is almost like a religion. And uh, when, we, when we mean peak performance athletes, we really mean those, those semi-gods. So our database is based on uh, Milan AC, Chelsea FC uh, databases, so really top athletes, athletes that play in front of millions of people. We work with executives, so elite executives, and we do lots of intervention in corporations, uh, working with uh, this uh, now you know very uh, important notion of occupational stress and the stress at work and the cost, the social cost that stress has on our society and on our uh, on our work. So positive psychology and. Uh, teaching uh, uh, stress regulation. Artists, so lots of the work uh, done by Professor Gruselier, which is one of the main researchers in the field of creativity, uh, alpha theta training. I had the privilege to work with him in London. He did lots of work around the idea that we can increase the ability for artists to perform in a creative way. A lot of his work done at the Royal College of Music was really showing how artists can increase their ability to improvise. So that's also one of the fields that we engage with. Uh, soldiers, so we are aiming to develop more work around not only helping soldiers that come back uh, from the battlefield, so ameliorating um, symptoms of PTSD, of trauma, but also getting them ready for, for duty, so increasing their level of readiness. And ultimately, uh, last but not least, of course, he is working with what I like to call wiser individuals. So it, we do lots of work with age-related decline. Um, we do very advanced work with a technology called uh, S. Loretta. So 
subcortical training, working with alpha density, and uh, we will be discussing about that uh, as well. So again, going back to what is it that we train in optimal performance? How can we summarize? How can we, because remember my promise was I was going to keep, I was going to keep it simple. So the idea is if we were going to choose three words, we want to increase attention, we want to increase calm, so we don't want to pay the price of being attentive uh, with pain with our level of calm. And we want to increase a sense of focused readiness, and these are words that I took from uh, Sue Wilson, another uh, amazing teacher back in, in Ontario in the field of optimal performance. So uh, how is it that we achieve these goals that I, I summarized in these, these three words? Well, let me just uh, take you along the three stages of intervention that we uh, based our model upon. Uh, first of all, we are working with optimal brainwave training. Um, so neurological training, and uh, this is the first point I will discuss. Secondly, we work with self-regulation, so psychophysiology. And again, I'll try and give you a more detailed um, insight of what is it that we mean with that. And the third, maintenance. Once we have achieved a certain state, we want to make sure that we don't lose it, that we maintain it. So let's start with the first, uh, the first level, the first stage. Uh, what is it that we do when we want to achieve an optimal uh, brainwave state? First of all, one size does not fit all, as we mentioned, so what we want to do is identify inefficiencies. We need to see where those inefficiencies are specifically for that individual. Secondly, once we've found them, we want to get rid of them, so really removing those inefficiencies. And thirdly, just because we are in the realm of optimal performance, we want to optimize them, and we will talk a lot about the, the notion of uh, being extraordinary, out of the norm for optimal performance. So again, let me uh, keep up with my promise. I was going to give you examples and images. What is it that I mean with identifying inefficiencies? Let's have a look at one way of looking at brainwave. This is a spectrum imaging. And this is, for example, you see all of that slow activity on the left side of the screen. This is too much of a slow brain. That's a non-efficient brain. What else? This is, for example, a 1 hertz pin uh, Excel uh, sheet, Excel table. Um, we see that this is, uh, she's a friend of mine, she's a journalist, a highly functioning individual, a too much of a fast brain. She has so much activity sitting at 21, 22 hertz. Very different from the previous one, very specific um, inefficiency that we want or aim to correct. So uh, what is it that we use at the Swingle Clinic to identify inefficiencies? What, it, what are measuring tools? There are several measurement approaches. Uh, we certainly use quanti a quantitative approach. We run uh, full brain maps, uh, that's for sure. But mostly we use uh, Dr. Swingle's proprietary assessment. That's the clinical cue. And the reason for this, the rationale, it's a non-expensive approach in terms of cost and in terms of time. It gives a very thorough assessment in less than six minutes, so that the clinical queue is around five minutes and 20 seconds. So let me go uh, through the for those of you that are not too familiar with that assessment, let me quickly describe what is it that we look at with the clinical cue. Typically, we look at five locations. This is the International 1020 system of uh, um, uh, sensor placement. And typically, we start with CZ. We look at the central site of the motor strip. And we have the client eyes open, eyes closed, eyes open, task, and then we administer Omni. We assess our subliminals. I will talk a little bit more about that. 
Second, we look at O1. I don't know if you can see my arrow. That's the back of the brain, the occipital lobe. And we have the client eyes open, eyes closed, and eyes open again. We then move our sensors and we compare the frontals. We compare F4 with F3. And uh, this is done eyes closed, obviously, because we don't want to run um, the risk of being exposed to much artifact. And last, we look at F6. Last, but in the, in the case of optimal performance, I should say last but not least, we look at um, the frontal cortex, FC, with eyes closed. So um, the, the result of this type of assessment is, um, is, a clinical, is the clinical cue. And let me just make an example of one of our athletes. Uh, one of our uh, clients that came to see us a couple of weeks ago. This is a top athlete. He's a 20 years old male, and uh, he complains about anxiety, struggles with depression. He has, he perseverates uh, with intrusive negative thoughts, and uh, his performance is finally compromised. Not a big surprise. Um, very intelligent brain, and let me show you where we see that. Where is it? Where? How are we able to see that his brain is intelligent? That is, he's an intelligent uh, person, intelligent young man. Okay, so let's go through the uh, through the clinical cue. This is how the uh, BFE clinical cue report looks like. And uh, for those of you that use it, I will recommend if you print it out for the client, uh, just uh, hide or delete the second uh, part, the, the part on the right where we are giving uh, hints or cues. Uh, they apply for our clinical population, not ne necessarily uh, for, uh, for the optimal performance population, and that's really the subject of this presentation. So this is your CZ report, and what we see is a, a very low, nice and low uh, theta-beta ratio, uh, we also measure, uh, remember we had the client be under task, we also measure our under task, theta beta, very nice and low. We look at this theta to SMR, again, very nice and efficient in that respect. Uh, um, is alpha, alpha peak frequency, there it is, it's your marker for mental sharpness, is very nice and high. This person, eyes closed, 11 hertz is his alpha peak frequency, and 10.4 is his alpha peak frequency, eyes open. So if we only looked at one channel, CZ, uh, one channel assessment, we would see uh, this. We would, uh, we would see that his brain is sharp, he's focused, we would see that he's an intelligent person, but our clinical assessment uh, would be quite limited. So what's fundamentally, fundamental and important in the clinical queue is we are looking at those five locations and we gather an immense um, quantity of information. So again, let's look at his intelligent marker, at its sharpness, sharpness marker, look at his alpha peak fre frequency at EC uh, with eyes closed and with eyes open, 11.4, 11.2, uh, this is nice and, and sharp, uh, but let's start and see what are the prices it pays in life. Let's look at his theta-beta ratio at the back of the brain, and again, follow my arrow, 1.02. Remember the brain has to be faster at the front and slower at the back. Sorry for this uh, little screen that pops up, I'll try and kill it as it shows up um, as a video game. So uh, the, remember we said the brain has to be faster at the front and slower at the back. This individual has the opposite uh, pattern. He, he has a very fast brain at the back. There comes your poor stress tolerance, your racing thoughts, all of that, uh, perseveration and, and, and fast brain at the back. And not only that, see what happens when he closes his eyes. See his inability to quiet the brain when he closes his eyes. This is quite crucial for an athlete. 
where, is the, where we work a lot with imagery, where we work a lot with uh, um, eyes closed visualizations. His beta, which dropped like a rock, as Dr. Swingle has it, in fact, uh, skyrockets uh, from 4.43 goes up to 6.64. That's a very high increase. So we start to see some really important potential for those inefficiencies that we talk about. And then again, see how uh, this tool is uh, so important. We're measuring now F3 and F4. We're comparing the frontals. See how his right prefrontal cortex is faster, so his beta frequencies are higher on the right. So there, there is your predisposition to uh, oh, there it is. Maybe I found a better solution. It says, don't show this message again, so I got the right one. <laughs> so this is your predisposition to depression, and, um, and I see that right there. What else? F FZ, sorry. FZ, this is now your uh, low to high alpha. This is a ratio that we work a lot with, uh, working with alpha density. So see how uh, nice and low this alpha density is sitting at 0 0.5, 4, 5. This is not only an athlete, this is a person that is also studying to become a charter accountant, a very sharp man. Um, so there is your low to high alpha, your alpha peak frequency, and there is another marker that we will talk about a lot, which we, we like to talk about it a lot. This is your high beta beta uh, ratio at FZ and sitting at 0.62, I will uh, talk about it later. And also, I will talk about what we, we will do with this individual, but not now. I will leave the suspense of our break and uh, give the word to my, uh, to my colleague Angie. Please, Angie. Hi, thank you, Hiroko. Um, I have um, a couple of questions. Um, one of them is, I am an actor and I experience anxiety and stage fright when I perform. Can this uh, method of training help me? Thank you, Angie. Thanks for the person that asked the question. And again, I'm really glad that these webcasts uh, are having more and more um, participants, there are not necessarily colleagues or people involved in the field, but are more potential clients or individuals that are directly involved in our type of work. So thanks uh, for, for asking this question. Uh, the answer is yes, this is absolutely a, a, an appropriate training for, uh, for, for you to pursue. We can, as I mentioned, Dr. Gruselier, working with artists, we can work with a stage, uh, stage anxiety, performance anxiety. Uh, again, the, the procedure will be normally based on assessing the brain. We will do a stress assessment, maybe put you on stage or a fake stage and see what happens in your brain or what happens to your physiology when you're on stage and what are the tools that you can learn at a neurological and physiological level uh, so that you can deliver your creative performance at its best. Um, and I have another um, question. I am a senior uh, director um, and uh, I sometimes feel like I, I'm working with so many things that I get distracted with my own ideas uh, and it becomes difficult to accomplish one goal. Can, can this help with my attention, attention span? Yes, absolutely. Uh, focus and attention are one of, I would say, the most targeted and targeted interventions and one of the fields where we get our best results. Uh, again, we look at markers such as theta-beta ratio um, at the top of the cortex, but we also look at uh, your theta-alpha ratio, what uh, um, we call frontal alpha ADD, sometimes Dr. Swingle calls it quite politically incorrectly female ADD, so the notion that we get distracted with our own creativity, with our own ideas. So again, it's very personal, it's very individual. Uh, the ability to focus, or better, the inability to focus can be 
triggered by very different markers. We need to uh, define them and then we can uh, custom make a, uh, an individual intervention. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, if anyone else has questions and um, you don't uh, want to do it on the, on the webcast, you can also send them to us via email at angie at swingleclinic.com. And now we will continue with the presentation. Thank you. Okay, so let me go again uh, the right um, spot with our uh, with our slides and uh, again being Italian I realize I'm aware of the fact that I speak a lot I might be a little bit um, late with the present long with the presentation so let me just uh, uh, focus a lot on brain driving but maybe I'll be a little bit faster in the last part of the presentation so brain driving is a very special procedure that we do at the clinic I actually moved on the other side of the of the world uh, just because this clinic is quite unique in what we do. So what is the deal with, um, with brain driving? With brain driving we apply the principle of classical conditioning of brain waves and we use a stimuli such as lights or subliminal sounds. And um, again this is Dr. Swingo's special uh, intervention, this is something that he worked a lot on and the idea here is that he has this patented um, system which gives the possibility to calibrate um, so the, the system is calibrated so that every time uh, let's say that we want to decrease a theta. We were talking about, for example, this uh, senior director that just asked the question. He wants to increase his focus. Most probably, maybe we want to decrease his theta activity after his assessment. So with brain driving, we have this system where every time this individual's theta is greater than a level set up by a therapist, then the system triggers some sound, some subliminal sounds, or triggers some lights uh, that are flashing with some goggles. So we have ways out to speed up the uh, neurofeedback process or the neurotherapeutic th process. Let me just make it more clear with, uh, with a couple of slides. So again, we're talking about removing inefficiencies. We're here looking at one hertz beans, um, a table where we're looking at one hertz at a time and again this difference between normal and exceptional this this was how a normal brain should look like but this is what an athlete looks like uh, this very nice and strong alpha peak frequency at 10 hertz so we don't want to lose that and see what Omni does uh, Omni is an uh, very powerful harmonic that Dr. Swingle patented and is very well explained in his books, uh, Biofeedback for the Brain, Swingle 2003. Um, so in the slide it's very clear how Omni suppresses all of your activity until 9 Hertz and it increases activity at 10, 11, 12. This is a very important notion for optimal performance just because we are training the extraordinary, not the normal or um, the ordinary. So here comes your old notion of optimizing specific brain waves. And uh, what is it that we train? Again, not one size fits all and again we are considering uh, non-normal individuals. And again the example I was mentioning earlier is the high beta-beta ratio. This is a ratio that at the clinic we call our, the stubbornness marker. Normally we are looking at ratios sitting below 0.55. So for a clinical client you would like to see his uh, anterior cingulate uh, to be not too hot as we say it, to be sitting at 0.5, typically 0.5 below 0.55. Now, uh, for again, for an optimal performance, this is all a different story. Uh, 0 0.66, uh, 6, 0 0.65, we see that very commonly, that's a marker for determination. And I can guarantee for or all of those of you that have worked with top athletes, their level of determination, and let me also say of stubbornness, is incredibly high 
AI. Those are individuals that train uh, six hours a day, seven days a week, or maybe eight days a week, they make up a day. Uh, so again, you want to keep that anterior cingulate to be mildly, mildly triggered, mildly hot. Obviously, too hot will be mental rigidity, uh, or there again, you end up having all of that, uh, all of those struggles with uh, obsessive thoughts, being able to get out, out of, a, of a negative loop. But there is your idea of determination that we don't want to lose. So again, this idea of mental flexibility. We're talking about special characteristics. One of them is mental flexibility. This is a quite a nice and important slide. Maybe one day uh, together with uh, T. Markness, my other beloved colleague in in London, worked with Chelsea. Um, maybe. He, we will publish this. This is a slide that shows um, the data gathering again from first team soccer soccer teams, so Premier League uh, Italian and England teams, uh, compared to the staff management of those uh, of those teams. So compare the orange and gray line with the blue line and see how much bigger peaks top athletes have, see how much more their, uh, their brain waves are and shifting into different mental states. This is, uh, I think this is quite beautiful and this is quite inspiring. So again, uh, we spoke, the, the slide was about high alpha, so shifts in high alpha. Um, so high alpha is a very important brain wave. Uh, if it's, uh, if it's uh, collected or measured at, uh, at the central cortex, uh, that's your SMR, so we are, no matter how we call it, we're talking of frequencies sitting between 12 and 15 hertz. And a couple of definitions here, uh, Thompson 2003 correlates with decreased motor and sensor activity combined with a state of mental alertness and focus. So really this combination between a calm state decrease anxiety and increase the focus. And again, Larsen 2005, it's called the high function in alpha and it correlates alert stillness and is also considered an anti-seizure and anti-hyperactive frequency. That's a golden standard treatment for ADHD, for example. Another definition, DEMOS 2005, that's your mental alertness and your physical relaxation brain. So very, very important. And I'd like to make a case here for how subtle it is to train this, uh, this brainwave. The ability of the trainer to trigger that mental state is quite crucial as people uh, that facilitate this type of training with optimal performers. We need to be quite good at what we're doing. Remember the research in the field of SMR started with uh, Barry Sturman the research that many of you in the field know uh, with cats. Uh, the cats were taught to produce SMR because they were ex expecting chicken broth. <laughs> so as a therapist, we need to make the client um, uh, feel that is awaiting some chicken broth. Obviously, it's a, it's a metaphorical chicken broth, but that's the idea. We need to inspire that in the brain of our of our client, and that's where a, a good therapist uh, uh, is needed. So again, we spoke about the three stages of intervention. I hope I did a nice overall about the optimal perf uh, performance brain wave training, and now let me talk a little bit about self regulation training. So uh, we're now talking about biofeedback, about training with peripherals and uh, really learning uh, or, or else uh, uh, supporting the client into its learning about the autonomic nervous system regulation. So really this idea that uh, the bio, with the biofeedback tools we can help individuals learning self-regulation abilities. This is the big uh, difference between the therapeutic application of neurofeedback uh, 
and the optimal performance application. In the clinical uh, arena, there is a therapist assisting a patient in managing or over overcoming sy symptoms. In the optimal performance field, um, uh, we are assisting the individual as he learns things about himself. Uh, so that's a very, very different perspective. And the notion is around the sense of self-efficacy. So again, I'm very passionate about positive psychology, a, uh, outstanding researcher, Sonia Lubomirsky, this idea of psychological well-being is based 50% on our genetics. Some are born happier than others, uh, just by nature, lucky them. 10% of our psychological well-being is based on our life, our set point, if we have a job, if we have a partner, if we have a family, if we have a nice car. That's just 10%. The rest is volitional activities. What is it that we, we, that we do uh, in order to increase that sense of psychological well-being? So this is where your sense of self-efficacy is quite important. And if we can increase that in our clients, we are increasing incredibly their uh, possibility to increase their performance as well. So I'd like to spend hours, years, ages talking about the psychophysiological mo uh, model, the, uh, the idea that as a uh, client of mine back in Italy, uh, this is an Italian athlete, once I showed him the biofeedback approach, I ran a stress assessment with, on him, he looked at me quite puzzled and he said, so do you really mean that the head is connected to the body? Yes, they are connected and the brain in fact sends neurotransmitters. So the hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal axis sends, uh, the, the brain sends uh, signals to the pituitary gland that informs the adrenal glands and then Angie and I really like these slides with the cortisol and the adrenaline and noradrenaline gets, getting in circle. I need to thank another colleague of mine in Chile, uh, that's Eugenio Lizama. Uh, if he's listening to us, thank you for this slide. We really like the, the cortisol getting all crazy. So again, Swingle 2008, peripheral biofeedback modifies the activity of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. This whole notion of break and accelerator, really sustaining the client in, the, in the learning about arousal, and preparation, but also about body calming and recovery. This is quite, uh, quite important. This is quite fundamental. Um, so again, I will have uh, more to discuss about how is it that we facilitate a type of training. But again, I'd love to uh, leave uh, the word to, to Angie for some question and announcements. Uh, and um, she's going to see if there are some relevant questions. Thank you. Um, and Hiroko, I don't know if you, if you want to show the slide that has my email address in case people want to send us an email and they're, they're shy to ask of a question. Of course I do. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. you. The swingleclinic.com. Don't hesitate and send in her questions or um, if you have the need to go deeper into some sub arguments or if you want to book sessions. And, uh, please feel free to contact her. That's Angie at swingleclinic.com. There you go, Angie. Thank you. Um, thank you to all of our listeners. Um, I have another question here. This is a golf player, um, and he's heard about biofeedback. He would like to know, um, he or she, how many times um, do they have to come to learn and increase their performance, and is there anything that they can do at home? Okay, thank you again for the question. I love questions from athletes. We have had very good results, extensive experience with golf players, again, back in Italy. Um, it's a field where we can really have very uh, significant results. Um, how many sessions? Again, very interesting questions. My boring question is, it depends. Um, but we also need to make a case here again for optimal performance. Having worked with top athletes, um, 
I have to be aware of the fact that an athlete that is going to play on Sunday in front of a couple of million of individuals uh, cannot wait. He cannot wait a couple of months. He, need to, he needs to get better, maybe not now, maybe yesterday. <laughs> so by Sunday, he needs to have learned things. So our interventions are quite, uh, just to use again one of Dr. Swingle's expressions, quite aggressive, they're quite hands-on, and we tend to be uh, quite fast in our interventions. So I would, I would reply with, with that. What is it that you can do at home? The use of um, harmonics is, uh, is fundamental. And again, we test the harmonics. So when you come here, we see what harmonic would be more appropriate for you and for your brain to use at home. We have other devices, we use light stimulation, so we provide, we can uh, provide our clients with goggles that they can buy and use at home. Uh, so we, again, we try and do as much as possible so that your uh, performance on, uh, on the green on Sunday is uh, at its best as soon as possible. I hope I have replied uh, clear enough to the, this good question. Thank you. Um, and a couple of people are also asking if um, um, where can they get a copy of these slides. Um, the the presentation is going to be uploaded as a video on our media page, uh, and it usually takes about a week. So if you go to swingleclinic.com under media under our webcasts, uh, you will see previous webcasts, and also um, today's webcast will be there. Uh, it should be posted by um, by next my next in the next five days. Okay. Yes. Thank yes, you. Yes, please feel again. Feel free to visit our website. We uh, try to keep it quite updated. We have lots of news about our events that Angie will talk about later. Uh, so I feel free to visit uh, the, the webcast later. Also for those that could not listen to me on a Saturday morning. So self-regulation training. Here we are. How we measure. Again, this whole notion of measurability is quite fundamental in this field. Uh, we uh, use uh, our stress assessment, which is based on the mind room assessment, so the same used by those athletes that we mentioned, and this is now the resilience cue or the precision neurometric stress assessment. Um, Typically, the assessment lasts around 20 minutes. We look at the whole physiology, so looking at EMG, two-channel EMG, we look at heart rate, uh, we look at the BVP, uh, respiration, both thoracic and abdominal, we look at skin conductivity and we look at temperature, and uh, we have 10 activities uh, of each two minutes, and this is just a screenshot of someone taking this um, assessment, and if you look thoroughly <laughs> on the uh, right uh, corner of the screen, you will see someone suspiciously looking like myself, those that know me. <laughs> That's in fact my, my screen, and I will quickly now hide it from you. So again, uh, self-regulation training. Uh, stress uh, responses, stress response patterns. This is an incredibly, mm, I really like these categories. They are from T. Markness. I hope one day he will publish this work that he did. I really find it quite outstanding. I will go and visit him in July back in London. I'm really looking forward to seeing him. And uh, what he did, he is he identified four categories, four typical physiological responses uh, that most probably correspond to four different profiles. And this morning I was playing, I was uh, reviewing the slides, and I was playing with these four categories. And I'd like, because I promised it was going to be a fun presentation, I'd like to give names to these groups. So the first one is the anxiety and avoiding behavior. And I like to call this the ostrich type, so the one that has high conductivity at baseline. Uh, this, person is, this person's performance is at risk. See this, uh, this screen. Uh, again, it might be a quite challenging screen for those of you that are clients. 
just to make it simple, this is your skin conductivity, that's the micro sweat in your hands, and the baseline, uh, not only the baseline, but the level of the micro sweat for this ostrich type or anxiety avoiding behavior is 8.45 micromoles. That's a quite high baseline, that's a quite high level of arousal. This is someone that is on a constant level of anxiety and most probably hiding the head behind the uh, underneath the sand like an ostrich. Uh, obviously, we will not use these names with our top athletes. They we're just going to keep them secret. Second group, that's the challenge, uh, the challenge group. So this group has a decreased temperature level, but with normal conductivity and normal heart rate. So see how low the temperature of this person is, and I like to call the, this uh, group the zebra. So this person is under challenge, is under threat, but his level of skin conductivity is, is okay. So he's not, he's aware of the challenge, uh, but he's not holding grudge to the lion for chasing him, <laughs> the zebra. He's, he's coping with the challenge, he's coping with the threat, but he's very scared if you have a if you're a zebra and a lion is chasing you. The third group is now the caged lion. So here we have both low temperature, low skin conductivity, and low heart rate variability. So this is the lion that is in a cage. It is a constant state of frustration. It's a constant state of uh, uh, misery. I like to use this word. I find it cute in English, misery. Um, so that's your lion group. And the third one is your ADD uh, client. So here, if we look at these theta-beta ratios uh, that we can calculate in this screen, there you have them. Uh, this is the inattentive type. So again, not a good uh, idea. That's your monkey type. is very distracted. Again, another uh, uh, not good pattern for a top of, for an athlete in general. So I hope a uh, team in London will like this, uh, these names uh, <laughs> that I gave to his categories. So again, once you have found the inefficiency in the self-regulating ability, how do you train? How do you want to train? And again, let me make the, the case for customized intervention. Precision neurometric protocols are always customized and individualized. So what we do is according to the assessment, we might want to train is the, the, the client's EMG baseline or arousal. We want uh, to train his skin conductivity control or his uh, temperature or his breathing ability. We do extensive work with RSA or HRV. We combine mindfulness approaches which are starting to become really my, uh, mainstream. So we do lots of work in that field, always based on the initial assessment. So again, this is one of our clients. And just figure out for yourself what type would this person be. Look at his skin conductivity level, starting at 7, skyrocketing at 11, uh, his uh, muscle, uh, 8, 15, very high baseline. This is, uh, this is most, uh, most probably an ostrich type or an anxiety avoiding type. Okay, so now as we are going towards the conclusion, of the intervention, we're also uh, of the of the presentation. We're also going towards the conclusion of our uh, intervention on, on the client, uh, the, the conclusion of our model. Once we have optimized the brain waves, once we have optimized the physiological response, now we need to maintain that state. Um, once we have achieved what could be called a state of coherence. So that natural state that takes place when we are in a state of well-being, doing what we like to do in that fantastic state, a desirable state when our level of psychological well-being is optimal, then we want to maintain it. So ideal states need maintenance just like 
your body fitness, just like your Ferrari, just like your Lamborghini or your Volkswagen Beetle, you need to take care of it. So again, uh, we want to see our clients for periodic uh, neurotherapy. Uh, as Dr. Swingo has it, uh, increasing optimal uh, functioning of the brain means increasing efficiency and intellectual performance. We need to keep up and to keep intellectually engaged. So we need to come back for tune-ups for the brain. And typically, we ask our clients to come back twice a year for speeding up or for fine-tuning our brain or their brain or our brain because we train as well at the clinic as therapists uh, or as managers. Angie does lots of sessions and so do I. So uh, twice a year that's typical but again when we work with age-related decline we want maybe to see our clients more frequently. Um, we want to uh, keep up his alpha density and also with optimal performers when they might have a, an important event, a performance, when they have some presentation, uh, they just want to, they, they just can come before that, that, uh, that event. So I think this is it for this uh, Saturday morning. I think I kept splendidly with time, leaving, um, leaving a part of my slot for Angie for her announcements. And uh, again, I think she will have a couple of questions and then she, have ve she has very, very important communications about our workshops and about our products and our future webcast. So let me just uh, say thanks to all of you that listen to me. I will have another uh, webcast in fall and you will tell you exactly when. And uh, thanks again and uh, let me just uh, give a uh, speech to, Sandy, uh, to Angie. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hiroko. That was very interesting. Um, we have, I'm just going to read one more question and then we're going to go uh, on with some announcements. Um, this is a really interesting question. What are the benefits of using a quantitative database as opposed to the clinical queue? This is a very interesting question and a difficult question. And I'm happy again to have a question for, I think, someone from the field. We, as I said, we use both. Uh, for more uh, complex cases, uh, brain injuries, um, individual seizures, concussions, we use a quantitative approach, we use a full brain map and we have a normative database. For our standard assessments we use the clinical cue. Now there is a very interesting article on NeuroConnection, the, the newly released NeuroConnection 2014 spring by Dr. Swingle where he really very nicely explains the the relevance of the uh, clinical database as opposed to the normative database. And all of this, dif uh, all of this notion of uh, the difference between a predisposition or else a vulnerability or susceptibility as opposed as the manifestation of symptoms. And this is where it's fundamental to look at your clinical database and the importance of uh, such a rich and vast uh, database as, uh, as our clinical one. So thanks again for the, for the question. I think it's a very good question and uh, this was an article on uh, neuroconnections by Dr. Swingle, uh, spring 2014. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hiroko. And uh, my first announcement is uh, regarding uh, Dr. Swingle's most famous book. Um, it is called Biofeedback for the Brain. Um, it is published um, uh, by Rutgers University Press uh, and we like to say that it is the most important book you will ever read for yourself, your children and your grandchildren. This is available uh, on our website at soundhealthproducts.com and also at local bookstores. Um, secondly, we also have the Clinician's Guide or Basic Neurotherapy. Um, this is a great book for professionals. Um, and it is uh, the best how-to book for uh, this type of treatment on the market and it's also available at soundhealthproducts.com. 
Uh, next, we have, as Hiroko mentioned, um, we just had our basic workshop uh, last month, and our next workshop that's coming up on October 24th and 26th is the Advanced uh, Neurotherapy for Professionals. It is a three-day workshop, and participants will be instructed on every aspect of the setup, recording, and treatment phases so they can apply it um, and treatment procedures in their practices. If you want to learn more, you can also go to our website at swingleclinic.com forward slash events, or you can also send me an email at angie at swingleclinic.com. And if you want to hear our future webcasts, these are some of the topics that we're going to have in upcoming months. You can also see what we've already been broadcasting since January. All of these are available on swingleclinic.com forward slash events, that's how you register. But if you also want to listen to previous webcasts, as I mentioned earlier, you can go to our media page on the same webpage, swingleclinic.com. And if you are a professional, uh, Dr. Swingle also offers online training through the Biofeedback Federation of Europe. You can visit the VFE's website at www.bfe.org and you can see all the offerings that Dr. Swingle has with webinars and online courses. The professionals who complete the courses can get up to 24 hours of continuing education. And there's also an email address there if you, wanna, if you want more information. And finally, uh, we also have a variety of products, like Hiroko was mentioning, things that you can use at home, like Omni or some of the harmonics and spectra glasses, etc. And these are all available on soundhealthproducts.com. And we also have a Facebook page, so if you want to follow us, uh, we will be happy uh, to have you. And this is the end of today's episode. We are hoping you enjoyed this and look forward to having you again next month. On July 12, 2014, the topic will be Autistic Spectrum Disorders. And again, to register, you can visit swingleclinic.com at events. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thanks for joining us.